me make sure I have your bio. Okay. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Saddleback webinar this week. My name is Liz Mangus, Literacy Specialist with Saddleback Educational Publishing. We've got a great session for you today. As you are logging in, please locate your control bar, which is at the bottom of your web browser window. That is where you'll find the chat, the Q&A, and the live transcript options today. We have a very interactive session for you today, so please make sure that you know where that chat icon is. Now, I know you, our audience is so great with chatting, so I know you all know how to do this already, but just uh, as a reminder, please make sure that you select everyone from the little drop down menu before you hit send on your chat so that everybody who is joining us today can see your comment. If you have questions, either for Saddleback or for our presenter today, go ahead and put those in the Q&A area, and we will get to those as we can, either throughout the session or at the end of the session today. And if you would like to take advantage of subtitles, you'll want to select Live Transcript and then click on Show Subtitles, and that will turn those on for you. We'll get started right at three o'clock Eastern time. In the meantime, find us and follow us on Twitter. Saddleback is on Twitter, as is our presenter today, Dr. Ivanya Soto. We're so excited to have her. So uh, make sure you say hello. And if you're watching the recording, you're not on with us live today, but you're watching the recording later, please still go to Twitter. Let everybody know that you joined us today. We'd love to see that. So let's see, we've got a couple of minutes before we get started. If everybody wants to go to the chat and say hello, let us know where you are joining us from. And while we're waiting for those chats to load, we'll say hi to our presenter today, Dr. Soto, how are you? Good, how are you? How is the weather and you're in Texas, right? I am in Texas and it is beautiful here. It's, it has finally turned into what we consider to be fall weather here, which is just, you know, not scalding hot every single day. So I'm, I'm really enjoying it. It's been, it's been uh, a long time coming. So how about you? You're in California, right? Yes, California, um, currently on the central coast. So uh, it's a little colder um, than Southern California. So but it's been nice in the 60s or so. We're going to get some rain Monday and Tuesday, it looks like, and we really need, you know, our, our fire, you know, conditions. And, and so, so it'll be, um, helpful to get a bit of rain. For sure. Uh, Lindsay says Monterey is her favorite place. Yolanda, oh. thank you for joining us um, from Dallas. Let's see who else is here. We have a guest from Turkey on, welcome. So we're officially international. Mm -hmm. Hello, San Antonio and in Indiana. Uh, Felicia says hello from, not sure where she is, but all right. Um, Sherry's here from uh, BC in Canada, welcome. And Corin is here from Toronto. Welcome everybody. Hi, Carly. Carly Spina is gonna join us for a webinar uh, in January. So we're always excited to have her on. Oh, Felicia's in spring, Texas in spring ISD. Welcome, that's not too far from where I am in the Austin area. Connecticut, New Mexico, Ohio, wonderful. We're so happy to see everybody today. Thank you so much for joining us. I love the green chili, New Mexico. Yes, it's um, still green chili season, right? Isn't that, I know here in Texas, every October, November, all the green chili things start to appear in the, in the grocery store shelves. So my Hatch chili salsa is uh, waiting in the, in the pantry right now. Too much information. Nobody needs to know what kind of salsa I have in <laughs> no. my pantry, but now you all know. <laughs> all right, enough of that. So let's officially get started for the day. Our topic is making sure that our multilingual learners are not sitting in silence, right? We want to work on those ORACY strategies. And Dr. Soto is going to talk to us all about that, the how, the why, uh, and why it is so important. So uh, we're thrilled to have her here today. If you don't know her, I will read a little bit of her bio just to give you a picture of, of who she is. So she is professor of education and director of graduate programs at Whittier College, where she specializes in language acquisition, systemic reform for English language learners, and urban education. She began her career in the Los Angeles Unified School District, where she taught English and English language development. She also served LAUSD as a literacy coach, as well as a district office and county office administrator. She has authored and co-authored 12 books, 
including ELL Shadowing as a Catalyst for Change, a bestseller that was recognized by Education Trust West as a promising practice for English language learners in 2018. She's also the executive director of the Institute for Culturally and Linguistically Responsive Teaching at Whittier College, whose mission it is to promote relevant research and develop academic resources for English language learners and standard English learners by a linguistically and culturally responsive teaching practices. Thank you, very qualified to speak on this topic. We're thrilled to have you. Uh, I'm going to let you take it from here. I'm just going to turn off my camera and microphone and I'll be able to pop right back in whenever you need me. Okay, all thank right. you. Thank you, Liz, uh, for that introduction and thank you all uh, for being here. Um, I guess what I would, a more personal, um, a bio, what I'd like you uh, to know about me is that I'm a, a former uh, second language learner myself. My first language was Spanish. I'm of Costa Rican descent. Um, my mother immigrated to this country um, when she was nine and really struggled uh, to acquire English at, uh, at a rate that um, uh, yeah, a rate that sh that she should have been able to, and so she became her own advocate. Um, uh, she uh, in high school enrolled herself in um, uh, English classes, additional English classes, and and her story, you know, ended up uh, quite positive. As did mine, and I have an older sister. We both became uh, teachers, English teachers, um, and English language development teachers. And so, but we know that a lot of the inequities. Um, that my mother experienced uh, continue to exist, unfortunately, for our multilingual learners um, and our English learners. Um, you'll notice that uh, the second edition, this presentation is based on uh, the second edition of the English Learner Shadowing book, um, and it's called Shadowing Multilingual Learners. At the end of the presentation today, I'll be um, giving you a code for 20% off of this book if you're interested. Um, so I will be, um, uh, I'm gonna start by sort of um, unpacking, typically a shadowing uh, professional development series is a three-day series. And obviously we're, we're kind of encapsulating this into one hour. So um, uh, on day one, we typically unpack uh, the shadow, how to shadow, um, uh, uh, an introduction to English learners, um, uh, the importance of listening and speaking. So the whole shadowing experience is about um, oracy as, as was um, uh, uh, explained in the introduction. Um, but we know that listening and speaking are two of the most underdeveloped uh, domains of language um, and that they're scaffolds um, for our English learners for reading and writing. And that's part of what I'll be unpacking uh, today. Uh, on day one, there's a bit of how to shadow. And each day we work on an oracy uh, strategy, um, an academic language development strategy. So uh, day one, think Parashare 2.0. Today we'll be unpacking that as well. Day two is Freyer model. Day three, we move into reciprocal teaching. And I saw um, in the chat box um, uh, a bit of um, about how writing, right, uh, speaking can can lead to writing or be a scaffold for that. And I'll also be addressing that. Um, if you are interested in the professional development that goes along with the book, um, at the end of the session, I will also provide uh, my email. Uh, so that you can contact me that way. But uh, what I typically recommend uh, when systems want to engage in, in shadowing and the shadowing series um, and professional development is that we start with administrators um, either at the district office or both at the district office and also at school sites, um, uh, move to instructional coaches and leaders, and then uh, uh, move into teacher leaders. Um, but today's presentation will be very much um, interactive, as Liz suggested, um, and will be uh, modeling uh, will be modeling oracy, an oracy strategy uh, that you can use in your classroom tomorrow. And that's what I call the Think Pair Share 2.0 or the Think Pair Share on steroids. Um, so what we know, I've been shadowing since 2003, and shadowing started in the Los Angeles Unified School District. Um, and what we know, uh, what I know from these shadowing projects 
is that, um, and this is actually a, a Wordle, right, uh, that came uh, uh, from a shadowing project in Sonoma County Office of Education. We know that our, our multilingual learners, our English learners, um, when there is little talk in the classroom setting, it can be a cold uh, atmosphere for them. It could be a frustrating um, situation. Um, that they might be, can, that they're oftentimes confused, they're stressed out um, in, in classrooms um, uh, that are silent. And so the whole point of shadowing is how do we disrupt that silence? How do we undo that silence? And how do we do that systemically? And as I suggested, um, the, the focus is really these two underdeveloped domains of language, speaking and listening. Speaking is a scaffold for writing. It's a mental outline uh, for the writing process. So when we allow our uh, multilingual learners to speak in the classroom setting, we are not doing so in vain. We know that it takes time, it takes organization um, to set up, right, uh, what we call productive uh, speaking opportunities. Um, but, right, the outcome is well worth it. Um, and similarly, listening is a scaffold for reading. And I'm going to have a listening activity that we will engage in um, uh, during our one hour together as well. So we'll be practicing both speaking and listening. This is the actual shadowing protocol form. Um, what we do when we shadow is we go into classrooms and we take a look at what I call a day in the life of an English learner. And at every five minute interval, the top of every five minute interval, we are tracking and coding the speaking and listening experiences of that one uh, multilingual learner that we are shadowing. Um, I'm not gonna go into how to use the protocol uh, too much. I wanna focus more on the oracy strategies, but I wanted you to see what this, what this looked like. And at the end of today's presentation, I'll be showing you how to shadow in a virtual setting using videos as well. So I love this quote uh, by Deborah Meyer and, and um, it's a good reminder uh, for me um, and for us all as educators that teaching is listening and learning is talking. And this takes a bit of, of a kind of unpacking, right, this quote, because we tend to think, and notice here I have a chat box question, so go ahead and think about and unpack this quote. What does this quote mean to you? How is teaching about listening and learning about talking? We typically think the opposite, right? We think that the teacher should be doing all of the talking. And unfortunately, at times we've been trained that way. Um, but I'm seeing if the one doing the talking is the one doing the learning, why do teachers uh, right, talk so much? Really, and it is a good right, self-reflective question. Um, uh, it, and Deborah Meyer reminds us that in fact, it should be the inverse, right? Um, shadowing, what shadowing always reminds me is the person doing the most talking is doing the most learning. Um, and that doesn't mean that as the teacher, I shouldn't be talking. I'm talking right now, right? Um, but it means that there needs to be this constant exchange between teacher and student, right? Um, where the teacher is constantly gradually releasing responsibility um, uh, for uh, classroom talk um, with our students. And so I'm seeing teaching is receptive while learning is more pupil uh, centered. As teachers, we need to listen to see what the students know and need. Students need to talk and show what they know and need. And yes, right, when we stop and listen to student conversations and we listen carefully, they, they tell us, right, what they need next. It's an or informal assessment, right? Um, it's a formative assessment. Um, talking can really clarify your learning. Yes, when you know something well, right, we all heard you're able to explain it, right? Um, and so, so making sure part of what today's presentation is gonna be about is how do we gradually release this responsibility often, right? Um, most of us can only listen for as old as we are. Um, I'm going to suggest that we shouldn't expect that even, that we should listen, uh, not require our students to listen for any more than 10 to 15 minute segments of time. And we know with primary students, that's even less, right? Where we would have to stop much more often. 
Um, the Shadowing Experience is based on the work of Pauline Gibbons, who wrote a book called Scaffolding Language, Scaffolding Learning. And she reminds us that there are many benefits um, to, to having our uh, English learners speak in the classroom setting. Uh, first, that they hear more language. They hear more language from a variety of sources, right? Not just the teacher. They speak more language. Um, oftentimes when students are in smaller groups or in pairs, um, they find that to be sort of a safer place, right? To take language risks. They understand more language. Um, typically students understand each other much more, right? Um, when they are in these smaller groups or, or pairs, they're willing to ask more questions. Um, and they're just overall more comfortable about speaking um, when they are in these productive either group work uh, settings or, or uh, pair uh, configurations. What other, so our next chat box uh, response is, uh, or question is, what other benefits can you think of to having students speak in the classroom setting? And I'm seeing, I'm, I'm taking a look at some other responses from our last uh, chat box question. Um, have sentence stems. And we're gonna to talk today about, right, um, how sentence frames can really um, build confidence, student confidence. Um, and, and actually Liz and I are gonna model that here in a bit. Increase confidence and connections, definitely, right? Um, that our students sometimes, right, with the whole group, they, they will perhaps not want to share. Um, but when they have shared in this safe space, right, this little community, um, either a small group community or in a pair, they're much more willing to share with the whole group. Structured visuals with vocabulary and exit slips, creating a classroom culture, yes, where they are comfortable to make mistakes. So, so uh, right, where, where, oh, and I see uh, below that, ways to correct pronunciation in a safe place and in a safe way, right? Um, so that we're not overly, we know that if we overly correct, that actually shuts language down. Um, and so we want to do that in a very uh, careful way. Um, so having norms um, for, for classroom talk um, uh, is really uh, helpful. So lots of great ideas coming in. And I see Debbie uh, Zakarian, one of my uh, co-authors, uh, Corwin and Norton uh, co-authors here. Um, so hello to you. Um, another quote um, uh, that I love to use and that I uh, added to the second edition of the shadowing uh, multilingual learners, that reading and writing float on a sea of talk, right? Um, another powerful quote that we kind of have to right, uh, digest a bit and unpack. Um, and so uh, in the chat box, uh, how does this quote impact your teaching or how, how could it? Um, so, so right, the, just the nature of the interconnectedness of the domains of language, as I suggested earlier, right? Reading and writing um, uh, uh, really benefit, right? Uh, our students will benefit from being able to, to speak and think through, right, an idea um, before they are required to, uh, to write about it. Talk, read, talk, write. Yes, talk is the scaffold for reading and writing to organize ideas and to experiment with ideas. Again, that mental outline, right? Speaking is the mental outline for the writing process. Um, the command of vocabulary in speaking affects our reading and writing of the same vocabulary. And that's where, right, oftentimes we should be reading the types of, of um, the genres that we, we um, uh, might have to write, you know, uh, in. Love this one without speaking skills. You don't really have a foundation for reading and writing. Yes. And so the importance of, especially when there are cognitively and linguistically demanding um, uh, uh, items, right, that we are teaching or content that we're teaching, that we really want to give our students an opportunity to, to sit and make personal meaning, right? Um, to think through and not just their first thoughts, right, but their best thoughts. And think about our English learners who are doing double the work, doing double the work of perhaps translating, right? Um, uh, information from the primary language, which is a resource and should be used, right? To get to English and academic English. Um, listening, uh, similarly, is a scaffold for reading. 
So if I can listen to my partner, and Liz and I are going to actually practice this here in a second, if I can listen to my partner and paraphrase what my partner has said, it's actually a, a, a similar process uh, with reading comprehension when I am asked to summarize text. And so our students need to be um, given opportunities to actively listen uh, to information. Um, and uh, again, the work of Pauline Gibbons reminding us that uh, listening should be primarily a thinking process. It's not just about um, uh, sound discrimination, right? Listening to individual sounds. And so, so listening is similar to reading in that when we read, we can decode, right? And then we can also on the other end comprehend. And similarly, when we ask students to listen to information, we should be really explicit and clear um, about what we're having them listen uh, for. So are we having them listen for specific information, which would be more like decoding? Or are we asking them to listen for overall meaning, which mirrors sort of the, the comprehension end of the reading uh, process? So being really explicit and clear, right? Um, our we typically aren't explicit and clear about listening until our students get in trouble for not listening, right? Um, and what we have here is Noonan's work on the different quadrants and ways uh, uh, to listen. We can listen socially, we can listen academically, we can listen in a two-way setting, which is a lot easier because I can ask for clarification, right? Or we can listen in a one-way setting which is more like a lecture. This is typically more difficult, right? The academic one-way uh, uh, type of listening is actually uh, the most rigorous. And so this is, I've highlighted it in red because uh, when we are asking our students to listen in this way, um, we really want to embed some scaffolds. So if it's a teacher read aloud, um, uh, I would scaffold this and make it more a more accessible way to listen um, by having stopping points, right? Or, or, or letting students know, as I am engaging in this read aloud, I'd like you to listen for keywords, perhaps, or listen for pleasure, right? And so be, being really explicit and clear, and then you can see uh, here that I'm going to have a listening, um, uh, a listening experience for you all here. I'm gonna have you listen to um, a video and it's called the Coronavirus Diaries. And as you listen, I'd like you to listen uh, for insights from these students. These are high school students at the, at the start of the pandemic. And uh, they are telling us, right, uh, uh, how they are experiencing the, uh, the pandemic at the start of the pandemic. And this is from a, um, a scholastic video, um, a scholastic article, um, and it, it, there's a video embedded. And it's actually, think about as well as you listen to this, um, some, uh, an activity that you might uh, want to embed in your own classroom, right? That, that helps students sort of unpack uh, the coronavirus or the pandemic, but then also write their own experiences in an SEL fashion. So you're listening for insights from these students. How are they similar to yours? My name is Jonathan Carroll Madden. I'm a senior at Ballard High School. My name is Haley Bruner. I'm 17. My name is Mei Mei Shu. I'm 18 years old. Hi, my name is Delaney Nelson. I'm 17 years old. I'm a junior at National High School South from Nashville, New Hampshire, and this is my coronavirus diary. The beginning of the quarantine was a horror movie. It just felt so weird. My mom is an emergency room nurse and my dad is a firefighter. I mean, I've always been aware of the, the risk that my parents are at versus people who work an office job, but I think this has made it much, much more real. The timing for this virus has been awful. My biggest worry is about when will life go back to normal. You know, I've been texting this one friend every day because I'm, I'm really, really worried about him. We're really worried about the health of our employees and the health of our customers, but also just like not spreading the virus. 
personally, I think it's too soon to reopen. I've always considered myself a pretty dedicated student, but I think it's tough for anyone to just have that amount of like intrinsic motivation to just finish all your schoolwork with no one else there. I'm going to um, Harvard College next fall. What if we have to have Zoom Harvard? <laughs> just... We ought to be really grateful for the essential workers in our lives. I just hope that this isn't happening in vain and that something will come from it. Okay, so that is again that resource is included in the PowerPoint, um, but it is a scholastic. Um, uh, it's a, it's actually not just a video, but there are a series of uh, uh, diaries that each of those students have um, have collected or did collect at the top of the um, of the pandemic, and so um, I, I think a. a, a a nice exercise, right, for your own students to, to complete um, the social and emotional impact of the, right, pandemic, um, helping our students to process that, right, uh, while they're also working on, notice that, that the way I used this particular video was I asked you specifically uh, to listen for insights that this video uh, might give you about your own students. So if you would type that or, or uh, type your response in the chat box, um, what insights did these students give you about right what your students might have gone through um, at the start of the pandemic, but even right coming back now, um, things are, are still um, right uh, not normal, and so. Um, it's hard to be motivated, right? Thank you, Karen. Um, the, the one, the one uh, young lady talking about, you know, no matter how strong of a student I am, it's really hard to um, to be motivated um, on my own, right? To do that on my own. They share the same fears and uncertainties with the virus. Some may catch the virus, and then thinking about, right? Some. Uh, students, family members, right? Um, multiple family members who have, you know, they've lost uh, family members. Um, they're worried about uncertainties, um, concern about parents, concern about family and friends. They lack interaction and contact with peers. And so, um, so re reminding us, uh, the shadowing experience is all about listening to student voices, right? Observing our English learners. Um, and learning from them. And so uh, here is yet another way, right, um, uh, to do this. And let me move this over real quick, okay. Okay, and so up to this point, notice that that was a listening activity, right? Um, that I used that video uh, to have you really listen for insights um, that your own students uh, might have coming back to school now. Um, and I mentioned earlier that most of us can only listen for as old as we are. Um, I hope you notice that I'm not having you listen for very long periods of time before I'm having you respond or engage in the chat box. Um, if we were face to face, those, um, uh, those experiences to engage in the chat box would be think uh, or partner talk um, experiences. So quick, talk to you know, uh, talk to your um, elbow partner about that question, right? That was posed. Um, but research uh, by Davis, Wincott, and Benjamin um, suggests that uh, students student attention during lectures wanes after about ten to fifteen minutes, and that attention is highest at the beginning of a lecture. And if we know that, right? Um, then uh, it really helps to guide us in terms of um, how often, right, we should be stopping and allowing our students to make personal meaning, either around text or around um, a, a lecture or around, right, any kind of material. So a piece that I have uh, added to the second edition of the shadowing book is what I call the 15 minute rule. And it's a good reminder for us as teachers, right, that, that within an hour, we might want to chunk our instruction um, uh, into 15 minute segments of time. So you might speak at the top of the hour for 15 minutes, 
And then if you're face to face, have a quick, as I suggested, partner talk conversation. Um, if you're still teaching virtually, uh, the chat box, right, is your friend for that uh, ongoing engagement. And then you can continue, you continue to speak, right? You have a second uh, partner talk or chat box um, opportunity, which notice this is what I have been doing, right, throughout my presentation. And then at the end, you might have a longer think, pair, share, um, or breakout experience if you are uh, teaching virtually. Um, and in the chat box, as I continue to unpack this, how do you see yourself using perhaps uh, the 15 minute rule in your own classroom? Um, for me, as I write, as I plan, I teach the college level and I'm, I'm teaching virtually actually um, uh, this, uh, this fall. Um, I, I use this, the same pattern that I'm using with you all, um, where I'll have a couple of slides and then I'll stop and have my students either engage in the chat box or have breakout opportunities, right? So small group uh, opportunities to, to unpack. I'm teaching research methods, right? So they need a lot of time uh, to unpack the, uh, the dense information that's, that, that we're you know, kind of working through. Um, and if you're forced to teach, I see in, in 2.5, uh, two and a half hour blocks, then the same, right? It would be, you know, still breaking, breaking up that two and a half hours into, right, 15 minute chunks of time. Um, if we know that the person doing the most talking is doing the most learning, then either, uh, it, you know, it's not in vain to help uh, to have our students stop and talk. Um, and, um, we either spend time in reteaching at the end because our students didn't get it, right? Because we didn't stop uh, to, to have them make personal meaning around content. Um, okay, good. So I see some, uh, Corin, uh, you teach French, so it works quite well, right? Uh, yes, so, so especially when we're teaching and practicing language, right? So that students are, are forced to use the language themselves, right? Um, and so we're going to move in now to this strategy that I have been uh, suggesting. Um, we might end a 15-minute um, rule uh, segment of time with, which is the Think Pair Share 2.0. So it's not a partner talk where it's just a quick talk to your partner. Um, there are multiple opportunities for speaking within the Think Pair Share 2.0. It's it's what I call um, Think Pair Share on steroids. Um, it all starts with an intentional strategic question, right? And so far I've been, you know, I pre-planned those questions um, and the, the questions that you all are responding to in the breakouts. And similarly, we need to be intentional and strategic with the questions that we pose for our think pair shares. Um, and uh, May, Duchess May reminds us that teachers who plan carefully crafted questions get deeper and more thoughtful responses. And that's what we want, right? Because oftentimes um, we might get from an English learner um, a one or two word response. And what we're trying to do is stretch that language out. Um, uh, the benefits of open-ended questions being that they require more language, right? So, so when we craft um, open-ended questions at DOK depth of level, uh, depth of level uh, two and three, or three and four, um, we will get those longer stretches of language. Um, it requires more language overall. I didn't mention that when we, when I first started shadowing in 2003, we found that our English learners were spending less than 2% of their school day in academic oral language production. Um, now, many years later, right, um, and actually last year, this year is the 10th anniversary of the first edition of the shadowing book, uh, over the last 10 years in working with systems on shadowing projects, I've found that our English learners are spending about 5 to 10% of their time um, uh, producing academic oral language themselves. We know that even that, even though that's better than less than 2%, it's not enough, right? And so these open-ended questions um, increases our English learners' use of details and justification for their thinking, and it allows them to enter into conversations on their own terms, especially when we're really thoughtful and strategic about, uh, about the prompt. 
And so we want, I, I suggested that we want to focus on uh, strategic thinking and extended thinking with our depth of knowledge of questioning. Um, and uh, right, these tasks um, allow our students to have multiple valid responses, right? Not just one, one, um, one possible answer. And that again, we're stretching that language out. They're justifying their choices and their responses. And then at the depth of uh, knowledge level four, um, our English learners are asked to synthesize information to uh, multiple sources, right? And transferring knowledge. And so that's the power of, of really pre-planning those open-ended questions intentionally um, ahead of time. The Think Pair Share uh, 2.0, um, it looks like this. This is the graphic organizer and you, you have received this along with the PowerPoint. Um, it begins with, right, we have this column um, that has an open-ended question section. Our open-ended questions, um, as we intentionally and strategically develop them, um, should be connected to uh, our lesson objectives, our standards, our assessments, whatever it is that you want students to be able to retain and recall, that's what you want them to talk about, right? Um, under what I thought, uh, this is some think time. Many times we, we ask our students to respond cold, right? Without giving them some time uh, uh, to think and to, to bring forth their best thoughts. And so um, here we are giving that think time, but we're also providing a sentence frame. And actually Liz and I in a second here are gonna model this, this whole process. Once students think through their ideas, they then share it with their partner. Uh, we also want to have intentional pairing, right? We want an English learner to be paired with a linguistic model and not a, a model that is too beyond, right, their own uh, ZPD, their zone of proximal development. Um, uh, we want uh, them to be challenged, but we don't want the other person to take over the conversation. Um, we then have our, our English learner would uh, listen to their partner and paraphrase their partner's response. Um, not parrot it, but, but paraphrase it. And then finally, there's a second opportunity for speaking. Um, students would synthesize their ideas um, in order to determine what they wanna share with the whole class. And so with that, Liz and I are going to uh, model this process uh, so that you, you see um, how you can implement it into your own classroom. The open-ended question that I have uh, uh, predetermined is what has been your virtual rose this year and your virtual uh, uh, thorn? Your rose being the best thing that happened to you, uh, that has happened to you virtually, especially those of us who are working virtually still. Um, if you are face-to-face, um, please think about what has been the best thing that has happened to you coming back face to face. Um, and then what, what is right, what are some challenges that you're dealing with? So, um, so Liz is thinking about her response. When she's ready to respond, she's going to use one of the expressing an opinion frames. So I think or I believe that. My job is to actively listen to my partner. So this is an opportunity for me to practice my active listening skills. And then when, um, after Liz has completed her response, I'm going to paraphrase using a, a paraphrasing frame. Notice that there are many other frames here, but when we first uh, begin with Think Pair Share 2.0, we wanna start with expressing an opinion and paraphrasing. And so Liz, what has been your virtual rose and thorn this year? Well, first of all, are you working still virtually? Yes, I am. Okay. So this works. Okay. So what has been your virtual rose and your virtual thorn? I think my virtual rose has been that I get to have a little bit more time in my day for um, time with immediate family, no commute. Um, it, it just gives me a little bit more free time, not having to go anywhere. But in my opinion, the virtual thorn is that it is harder to communicate with people um, and uh, clearly communicate and get across the messages um, that I need to get across. It's much easier to do that in person sometimes. Okay. So what I'm hearing you say is that your virtual rose 
is that you get to spend some uh, quality or more immediate or uh, more quality time with your immediate family, right? Um, because you're not you're not um, traveling anywhere, right? You're not commuting. Um, and then your virtual thorn is that it's more difficult to communicate, right? When you're not face to face, perhaps even just the nonverbal, right? Communication. Um, okay. And then so Liz would say, I see her nodding. So if if she your partner would then agree yes or no that's what I said only when my partner says that or shakes her head would I write um, her ideas under listening so I would write I would paraphrase what I just said in spoken language in written language in this in this quadrant and so now I'm going to share with Liz. And, and she's going to practice her active listening skills, uh, which can be a little difficult in the afternoon, uh, but we're <laughs> going to try it. We were successful and we have high expectations. So my virtual rose was, uh, and they're similar, the rose and the thorn. I'm still teaching virtually. Um, I have actually enjoyed, and even last year, um, being pedagogically challenged, uh, you know, virtually. So how, right, uh, trying to figure out how can I approximate what I do face to face in a virtual setting, right, has been fun, a fun challenge for me. Um, and then my thorn is that sometimes those things that I'm trying don't quite work, right? Um, and so, so it's kind of the same thing, but um, right, both, both the positive and negative sides of it. Okay, so what I heard you say is that your virtual rose is that it has been fun sometimes trying to figure out the puzzle of how to try to teach virtually, that you see that as a challenge that um, was, is fun to rise to that challenge. But the thorn is sometimes it doesn't always work and then you go back to square one and try, try something new. So that kind of trial and error process can set you back. Um, so rather than if you're teaching in person, you already know what works. So you already know it will be efficient. So, but this, with this, you have to try things and it, does, it doesn't always work. Mm -hmm. Nice. Okay. Yes. And I agree. So then Liz would go ahead and write down my response under what my partner thought. Um, we could use, right, your English learners would use the frames to uh, not only for spoken language, but also for written language to begin a, right, syntactically appropriate um, sentence. Um, and then under consensus, we would decide um, if we would share what I said with the whole class, if we would share what Liz said with the whole class, if we would combine the two, or if we would come up with the whole idea, a new idea. Sometimes as you have the conversation, um, you might have a whole other idea that, that kind of arises. It doesn't really lend itself to this question, but it might to other open-ended questions. So that is the think pair share. Thank you, Liz. For, You're welcome. Um, that is the think pair share 2.0. Um, and you do have, I noticed somebody asked about the PowerPoint and you do have the PowerPoint link. The link was just, thank you. Um, thank you, Tom, um, for, for asking that and the Saddleback team. Um, these are the four options that I just uh, noted. So sh what we share out with the whole class can be what I said, what my partner Liz said, a combination if we had uh, very similar ideas. Uh, uh, each of these takes a bit of a mini lesson, right? Especially showing students how to put those two ideas together. And then um, uh, again, uh, the goal is eventually that students would uh, produce a whole new idea from a conversation, right? And that it wouldn't just be kind of parroting what your partner said. Um, so that is the first strategy in the, the shadowing series. Again, there are, and in the shadowing book that, uh, that is outlined in chapter 10, the oracy strategies are all in chapter 10 of the book. Um, and right, the whole uh, purpose of the shadowing training is to take a look at a day in the life of an English learner. Um, this is an ethnographic research method where we go into classrooms uh, to monitor um, the academic oral language output and the listening experiences that one, each of us would represent one English learner for two hours. We would observe them for two hours. Um, and this helps us to get a glimpse of the levels of productive speech and active listening that occur in K through 12 classrooms. I suggested that at the beginning um, uh, in 2003, when I first started shadowing, 
uh, the rates were at about less than 2% of an English learner's day was spent in academic oral language production. Now, um, when systems have, have done some work in this area with like Kagan, right, or, or other um, Kate Kinsella's work, um, uh, that, that now I'm seeing about 5 to 10%. Um, what's really helpful about the shadowing tool and process is that, and I've had several districts that I've worked with, Anaheim Union um, High School District actually uh, set a district-wide goal for academic oral language production. Uh, for all of their students. And they said it pre-pandemic, it was 30%. Their goal was to get all of their students speaking 30% of the school day. And that's in fact what Pauline Gibbons recommends in her book. The objective of shadowing is to open our eyes, to be self-reflective about our own practices and not to point fingers at anybody. Um, we want to recognize how the presence and absence of productive speech and listening affects student learning, right? Um, students who, who aren't speaking or, or, or uh, required to speak um, as often in the classroom setting are less engaged, right? And so it really helps with the engagement process as well. It serves as a shared second language experience for schools, for districts, and for county offices, and then a bridge uh, uh, of those uh, uh, research-based strategies, right? So the Think Pair Share 2.0 being one of those oracy strategies that really can um, help our students uh, to, to be required to speak in the classroom setting. I mentioned this quote, right, by this LAUSD uh, teacher. Um, she said, the person talking the most is the person who's learning the most. And she realized I'm doing the most talking in my classroom. Um, and so again, that self-reflective uh, process that um, uh, that should that our that our teachers should be engaged in, um, and so so I see uh, so shadowing is a scientific method. It's not a practice. No, it's a practice for for teachers. And ethnographic research is is a research method that that teachers can do um, and be embedded in their own classrooms. Um, so during our, our you know, virtual teaching uh, time, many teachers um, chose to record themselves on Zoom and then use the tool afterwards. Face-to-face uh, -face shadowing, standard or traditional shadowing, uh, you would be conducting the shadowing project in somebody else's classroom. So you are going in, observing an English learner in another classroom. And remember, we're not observing the teacher, we're observing the student and learning from the student, right? Um, uh, what, what we might need to do to change our own instructional practices in our classroom um, with our own English learners. Um, this is a quote from Sandra Cisneros, um, her, her memoir, A House of My Own. She says, at home I was, I was fine, but at school I never opened my mouth except when the teacher called on me. I didn't like school because all they saw was the outside of me. And this was uh, when I came across this quote and read her, her memoir, um, I realized that right, I, she's such a prolific uh, right, author and writer. And uh, we may have Sandra Cisneros in our own classrooms, right? And because we don't take the time to, to ask them to you know, bring forth their ideas, um, uh, we may not you know, understand their, their, their gifts. And so a reminder to right, um, have our English learners and all of our students speaking um, uh, more often in the classroom setting. And so in the chat box, uh, what are you hearing is the purpose of shadowing? Um, and what is, its possible, what is the possible impact that you see it having? And I'm glad that uh, Corin, you, you um, asked about right, the scientific method um, and that it's, it's a tool that, that all educators should be able to use, right? To, to be able to, um, so, so maybe aligned with action research, right? Because it can be done in your own classrooms. Um, uh, and virtual shadowing options. So um, I just shared how you can shadow, right? With a sub going into somebody else's classroom. Um, you can record your own lesson. Many teachers last year recorded um, themselves on Zoom, and that's kind of the, you know, the helpful part of, of, of Zoom. Um, and then they, they, you know, found an English learner, 
um, and then monitored, right? Uh, their uh, academic oral language production at every five minute interval. Um, you can shadow in a breakout, somebody else's breakout session, um, or shadow using Jeff Swear's videos. And so I want to show you how to do that. Um, I want to show you those videos um, uh, so that if you're interested in exploring the shadowing process, you can, uh, you can do that. And so what's really nice about uh, Jeff Swear's videos is he has a series of videos at different grade levels. Um, and, uh, and I'll go back there. So different uh, videos at different grade levels, different content areas. And they're all um, uh, exemplary, exemplary practices, right, across content areas. So students talking about math topics or uh, science or language arts. Um, and uh, what you would do if you shadow using these videos, there are nine videos. Each video is only three minutes long. So you would, um, you would take down what the student is saying at the beginning of the video and then at the end of the video. So let me show you a quick snippet of this conversation. Why do you think an important theme in this book? So what do you think is an important theme of this book? And so what we would do then is we would transfer that conversation onto the shadowing form. And I'll show you that here. Okay. So here's the shadowing form. Here's the shadowing form populated with the conversation that you just heard. So what happened at the start of the video? What do you think an important theme of the book is? The student ends up um, responding, the partner ends up responding, an important theme is real courage. And then we would code in between. Um, so here it would be coding student to student talk. Um, I would then also code at the end of the video. Typically with shadowing face to face, you would code what you saw at the start of the five minute interval. Here with the videos, you would take down what happens at the beginning of the video and at the end of the video um, so that you get kind of a, a full sense of, of the conversation. Um, a part of the shadowing process, especially when you shadow face to face, is obtaining the most uh, information that you can about the English learner that you're shadowing. So first name, date of birth, date of entry in US, date of entry in the district, and then um, test results. So this is our language assessment in, in California. This is our content assessment in California, grades, GPA, unit assessment data. And looking for strengths first, right? Um, you are collecting data, observational data um, about your English learner when you go into the classroom. Um, but we also want to see, right, what are some patterns over three years? Um, how have our our English learners been progressing over time, the, the, the student, the, the English learner that I'm going to shadow. And so uh, just to close this piece, some do's and don'ts for shadowing. Do shadow at the school level of your assignment. What that means is if you're an elementary teacher, primary teacher in particular, go into a primary classroom or watch primary videos. Um, do become familiar with the form. And if I, uh, again, I'm gonna give you a code if you'd like to purchase the book, but I will also, Liz, I don't know if I sent you the article, shadowing article, and if, if I didn't, I will follow up with an article um, that you can read more about the shadowing process itself. Do maintain focus on the student. Remember that we're not shadowing the teacher or we're not shadowing other students. We're only shadowing that one English learner. If you're going into somebody else's classroom to shadow them, don't ask for a boutique assignment. What that means is, uh, you know, just you want to see uh, natural practice, right? You, you don't want to uh, change the phenomenon any more than usual by having you come into a classroom. Um, don't ask the student any formal questions. We don't want the student to know that we're shadowing them because we know that students will begin to change, right, um, their practices. 
Um, we typically also don't tell the teacher exactly who is being shadowed because that also, if I know that you're, you're shadowing Josue, then I might start, you know, calling, overly calling on Josue. And we want to see, right, just uh, the natural phenomenon. Um, and then don't share evaluative statements about the teacher or the class. So if you shadow in somebody else's classroom, a colleague's classroom, I usually say, thank you for letting me into your classroom. Um, but I don't say good job, because even good job is evaluative, right? And we're not evaluating teachers um, with the shadowing process we're learning from student voices, right? Just like we did with the, that video, the coronavirus uh, diaries. And uh, with that, um, uh, here is the, uh, the link to the Corwin uh, website if you'd like to purchase the book. Um, there's a 20% discount. Uh, if you, the code is webinars in all caps for 20% off of that book if you're interested. Thank you, Liz. Um, I see in the, okay, I want to take a couple of the chat box responses before I hand it over back over to Liz, um, that Sherry, um, the, the last chat box question was, right, um, what is shadowing? What are you hearing shadowing to be? It's a way to observe how a student belongs, ooh, and the belonging literature, right, so important, especially now, and participates with his or her class. Uh, these observations help to find other ways, yes, to support the student. So again, another formative assessment, right? We're learning, uh, going back to Deborah Meyer, we're learning by listening to students. Uh, Karen, the data collected can drive conversions and lesson plans uh, to include more time for students to talk um, academically. Yes, and it should impact our daily practice, right? If, if we tend to see that students are are um, listening more often, um, then, then perhaps we're, we're gonna reform the way that they listen, right? Um, and we're gonna require them to, to not only listen, but to speak as well, uh, to raise students' awareness. Thank you. Um, uh, I, deliberate, I, I deliberately chose other instead of better ways. Yes, yes, no, definitely. Better ways because, right, I mean, each student, uh, you know, has a has a uh, a way of learning, right? When we differ differentiate, and so it's not better; it's it's other ways, right? And and ways that that uh, are personalized for that particular student. Thank you. Okay, and so with that, we do have the we have the link in the webinar. I am also going to put the uh, the Corwin link in there that I have. So that, that's at your fingertips as well. And I'll stop sharing. And then um, Liz, anything else on your end? And I thank you all for being here. I know it's yeah. a tough time. Thank you for being um, engaged and, and continuing to work on your practice. Thank you so much for coming and uh, spending time with us today, Dr. Soto. Um, I want to let everybody know before you leave today, uh, if there are any last minute questions, go ahead and drop those in the Q&A so we can address those. Uh, and in the meantime, I'll let you know who is coming up on our next webinar. We have Dr. Arena McGrath and Michelle Shorey returning, uh, and they're going to talk about digital and print reading. So when we think about all of our students who are having to transition to reading digitally. Now we know that a lot of them have been texting and browsing for a long time, but what about reading for information digitally instead of having a book in your hand? Um, are there differences in how we need to approach that? Uh, how do we make sure they are equipped to, to read no matter what the format is in front of them? So these are some of the questions we are going to be discussing on our webinar with uh, Dr. McGrath and also Michelle. So you can join us for that next week on Thursday. This one is going to be at two o'clock Eastern time. Uh, I'm sorry, two o'clock Pacific time, five o'clock Eastern. So a little bit later in the day. I uh, just wanted you to be aware of that because it's a little bit later than we normally do. Um, you will be receiving an email prompting you to register and you can also sign up for this on our website. And also don't forget 
that we have our new Go ELL Literacy Library available. These are great high interest, low reading level books, great for newcomers. Uh, they're very accessible and they still integrate lots of great uh, tier two, tier three vocabulary as well. So a great resource, beautiful books, very engaging. If you have any questions, uh, please reach out to me. I'm happy to tell you more about this. All right, let me jump in to the chat and um, to and see if there are any questions. Um, let's see. Okay, so the a couple of things I wanted to address. The webinar recording will be available within 24 hours. Uh, we'll be sending out a link. If you are watching this webinar recording, um, you can check the description uh, for links to the handouts and materials. And I did check out our handouts and we didn't, uh, we didn't have the article, Dr. Soto. So if you do send that to us, uh, we will also add that uh, link in the description. So uh, you can check out the recording. I'm sorry, I put the link in the chat box here. Oh, okay, she put the link in the chat. Excellent, we'll still add it to the, we'll still add it to our um, description of, of the recording. Um, so uh, just to, to clarify that. All right, just scan the, the chat one more time. Yes, Tom, we'll be sending you that link to the recording. Wonderful, okay, yes, you sh there, there's the link and we will include the link to that article in our resources as well. Uh, Robert, um, our loyal, one of our loyal webinar attendees, Robert, he dropped a question in the chat area around writing is thinking. Now, I, I believe that's a writing framework or is that a particular curriculum product? I'm not really sure. Um, it, it might be a writing protocol, um, but are you familiar with that, Dr. Soto and how, how to point him in the right direction of integrating the principles you shared today with that particular framework? I'm not aware of the framework, but I do address um, in the book how to move from speaking to writing. So you can read more about that. There's a whole chapter on um, on speaking um, and then and then how it can transfer to writing. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and I think that's about it. So we, uh, we hit the one hour mark, perfect timing. Thank you so much, Dr. Soto, for joining us. And thank you everybody for joining us. And uh, we will see you at next week's webinar. Have a great day. Bye.